you're looking at a uh, young man that uh, I want trying to be saved. I want try. Hey, girl, I want trying to live. Uh, uh, I recently moved to Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, I met my beautiful wife there. God has totally blessed me, turned my life completely around. <laughs> And this is what I want to say. I'm going to testify, mother. This is what I want to say. If you if you trust in God, because I left Memphis with a job, didn't know I was going to have a job when I left. But look at me now. Say, God has blessed me. This is a holy church. 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 This is a hand clapping call. Sisters, I am happy to present to you our processional, which begins on this great day of celebration. Our processional begins with the leader of our denomination, none other than the presiding bishop and the chief apostle of the Church of God in Christ, the most reverend Charles Edward Blake Sr. of Los Angeles, California. If you would, let us celebrate him all today. the 
So say yes. I want to give you a couple of minutes of my time. If God has done anything for you all this year, this month, this week, this day, Bishop to the general board and to all of you, that's here. Excuse me for not calling in time roll. Amen. But I think, let me tell you this, Bishop Blake, amen, is to the church of God in Christ what the Pope is to the Catholics. I think somebody ought to shout. Amen. When I hear his name, I praise the Lord. I thank God for him leading us. Tell the Lord, thank you. Amen. Thank God. Praise the Lord for the Queen of Andersonville. The Lady of Joyce. Praise the Lord. Amen. 
And if there is anybody from the second jurisdiction of Arkansas, I want you to stand up and make some noise. <laughs> <laughs> but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel and it shall come to pass in the last days said God I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaiden, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Amen. Look at somebody and tell them the preacher said, the shift. The shift. This is the man wrote a book called The Century of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he was not referring to the first century. The Holy Ghost did not begin with the apostles, nor did he stop working at their death. The 20th century I've been called the century of Pentecost. It was in that era in 1906 where our leader, the founder of our church, heard about a revival in Los Angeles, California, on the Azusa Street that traveled there and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. Tell the Lord, thank you, somebody. And praise the Lord, well, that was one of the greatest movements but however, I believe that the greatest move of God has yet to be seen. I believe God is getting ready. Amid all of the chaos, amid all the problems and things that's going on in this world, I believe that God is getting ready to move. I believe that, hallelujah, he's getting people ready. And do you want to be in that number? Do you want to be a part? Shift. Amen. We got to put aside and replace. Amen. A shift means to put aside and replace it by another or something else. I believe God, and I, we got to be careful. We have to be careful in the church of God in Christ, who, amen, was a bit one of the beginning of the Pentecostal movement. We have to be careful that we don't get to this point in life and lose what God gave this church. Y'all ain't gonna like me. The biggest threat, the biggest threat to our church today is an epidemic of church operating in the flesh and not in the spirit. People are being deceived into believing that a watered down version of the gospel is sufficient for these times. So we have a mixture of psychology and self-improvement ideology masquerading as Bible truth. There is a perverted Christianity in the land. Uh, Christianity without a cross. Uh, a religion without the saving blood of the Lamb. A religion with no commitment, no sacrifice, no requirement of obedience, no demands to live holy, no moral standards, no relationship of righteousness, no experience of forgiveness, no devotion of the word of God, no loyalty to the body of Christ, no power to deliver, no anointing to set the captive free, and no authority to victory over temptation, the flesh, amen, and the attack of the devil. The enemy desire is to take away from us that that God has given us. Somebody tell the Lord thank you. We have the end time apostate church. Amen. Just as God's word forewarned us 
The Apostle Paul called this emergent Christianity a form of godliness. A form of godliness. Amen. We don't want our church reduced to entertainment. A form of godliness. Amen. I'm talking about, I'm talking about, amen, this church. When I, 50 years ago, when I came to this place, Mason Temple, I stood back there at that wall, on that wall, couldn't get a seat. This place was packed. The power of God was moving. Amen. I don't want to see this place reduced. Y'all ain't gonna like what I'm getting ready to say. I don't want to see it reduced to a three-day meeting in April where we argue and fuss. God want to heal us again. God want to deliver again. God want to set free again. God want to see people walk away from crutches. He want to see us get away from, amen, get up out of wheelchairs in this place. Somebody tell God, Lord, help us. Tell God, Lord, help us. But I feel a shift y'all coming. I feel God. And when I listen to the panel this evening, I see God getting ready. When I hear the little Porter guy, amen, Brother Porter, I had to talk about, amen, the youth. Let me tell y'all something. If we're going to be the church that God called us to be, we have to start investing into our young people. They got to see something in us. They got to see more than us. They have to see more than us. There's got to be love. I shall know. Tell God, thank you. We got to be able. If, 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 if I'm going to come in and shake hands. What? Uh, what? <laughs> Church of Laodicea, sin at the door and knock. It has nothing to do with sinners. He's knocking at his own church door and he can't get in because we got a whole lot of other stuff going on. He said, Let me in. No, it's my time to preach. Let me in. I'm getting ready to sing a solo. Let me in. God bless you. You always give us something great, Ella Quick, amen, and we appreciate the God in you, how he continues to bless you. You're a gift to the body. You're a gift to the body, Ella Quick, amen, and don't take that lightly. I appreciate you personally, amen, for what you mean to me, amen, amen, but I thank God for the gift that God has given in you. Great is our gratefulness. Great is our faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. to me. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. You may be seated. Give up 
honor to God, Pastor Rogers, First Lady in her absence, Mother Rogers, Mother Leona Rogers, Mother Daniels, my First Lady, Sister Quick. It is always a pleasure to be in your presence, and tonight I am honored to. I'm honored to be here because when I look around and observe God's people so diligently in his services, it still makes me proud to be in the brotherhood of the Church of God in Christ. Yes. Pastor Rogers is a loyal worker in the church. He is diligent in the services of our God. Amen. And he is still giving of himself without reservations. Yes. Would you put your hands together and give Pastor Rogers a round of applause? Now I'm not going to take up a lot of time because the hour is well spent. And if you like Pastor and myself and others, this is our third service. And my wife said, you know, we, we haven't did this in a long time. Had the same clothes on all day long. We haven't even been home. And amazingly, I, I looked at Brother Wright and I said, whoa, Superintendent Williams. We kind of overworking now. We kind of overworking, Brother Wright. But he's younger than I am. His father and I go way back. He's, his father is actually close friends with my younger brother. So when I look at him, I'm dating myself. But let me dispense with the preambles of my nature and get about the business of preaching the word of God. I have come to realize that words are very important. Yes, sir. Scholars say that you study, when you study the Bible, you seek the verbs in the text. Because the verbs is where you get the action. For instance, in Genesis, the third chapter in the sixth verse, there are four verbs. It says, when the woman saw, that's verb number one, the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took, that's verb number two. She did eat, that's verb number three. All right, sir. And she gave, that's verb number four. Yes, sir. A look became a lust, a desire became a decision, a choice became a chain, a simile became the seducer. Verbs are important. Words are important. Scholars also say that when you read the Bible, you should seek out the subject in the text because you find, when you find out what the subject is of the text, you find out what the penman had in mind when he penned what he wrote. When you find a sinner with no subject, you become the subject. <laughs> Ephesians, the sixth ch fifth chapter, and the eighteenth verse says, "And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit." And since there is no subject in this text, who should be filled? Talk to me. You should be filled yes. with the Spirit. Yes, sir. John 8 and 32 says, You shall know the truth, uh -huh. and the truth shall set you free. Yes. We're going to hear a little truth tonight. All right. Paul, in Paul's day, some people were saying that there was no resurrection. Paul says that Christ has not risen from the dead. He expressed the utter fatality of our faith. He expressed the uncertainty of our atonement. And he expressed that each of us is cursed with the weight of unpardonable sin if Jesus didn't raise from the dead. Ye are yet in your sins. That means that we are all skating on the spider web over hell. That soon or later, we are all going to plunge into eternal damnation. The resurrection is what separates us from all other faith. Amen. Buddha died. Say it again. Buddha died. Right. Yes, 
sir. Muhammad died. Yes, sir. And Donald Trump's going to die. All right. Jesus is the only one that died in Galilee. Now you need to walk with me this evening. You have to follow me. I'm going to give you some scriptures and at the end I will help you understand the meaning of my message. I will not say a whole lot because it won't make a whole lot of sense until the end. But there are 10 resurrections in the Bible. I'm going to explain each one of them to you at the end. Let me begin. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, 20th verse says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and becomes the first fruit of them that sleep. Yes, sir. In 1 Kings, the 17th chapter, and the 17th verse, Elijah raises the Zebedee widow's son from the dead. Yes, that was the woman who was preparing a meal for her and her son. Yes, sir. And they were going to eat it and die. And Elijah blessed the food and it just kept the pot never ringing dry. Yes, Second Kings, the fourth chapter, the 32nd verse, Elijah met the Shulamite woman. And her child had died. Yes, sir. And he raised up from the dead. Yes, sir. 2 Kings 13, chapter 20, verse, Elijah died. Uh -huh. And they buried him. Yes, sir. And the Moabites, which was a bunch of hoodlums, were burying a man and they cast him into the sepulcher of the tomb of Elijah. And when the man touched the bones of Elijah, he stood up. My God. My God. He got up. My God. Over in Matthew 27, chapter in the 51st verse, Jesus died and rose. And when he rose, the graves opened up. And many of the saints that were asleep arose. Over in Luke, the 7th chapter, in the 13th verse, a widow named in the city of Nain, son, was dead. And Jesus said, Arise. And he got up. Luke, the 8th chapter, and the 41st verse. Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, his daughter was sick and dying. She finally died, and Jesus went and raised her from the dead. Yes, sir. Over in John, the 11th chapter, and the 14th verse, Lazarus' sister sent a message to Jesus to let him know that her brother was sick unto death. And Jesus waited until he had been dead for four days. And then he went to see about Lazarus. When he got there, Lazarus' sister said, if you would have got here earlier, my brother would not have died. Yes, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Yes. He that believeth on me, though he be dead, Yet shall he live. Oh, bless his name. Oh, then, John, the 11th chapter and the 43rd verse, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus got up after four days of being dead in the tomb. He got up. Oh, bless his name. Lazarus got up. Oh, bless his name. Oh, in Acts, the ninth chapter, the 36th verse, a disciple named Tabitha, she was full of good works. She got sick unto death. And she died. And Peter came, kneeled down and prayed. And Tabitha's eyes opened up. And she began to speak. She got up. Oh, bless his name. Over in Acts, the 20th chapter, and the 7th verse, Peter was preaching. He preached until midnight. And Eucalyptus fell asleep on the third floor of loft. 
and fell out the window. Dead. Peter went down in Acts, the 20th chapter, the 10th verse, and Peter embraced him and said, Trouble not yourself. His life is in him. Yes. That was the ninth when there was ready soon to day yet. First Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the 20th verse says, But now is Christ risen from the dead yes, and become the first fruit of them that sleep. Yes, What's important about that? What does that mean? Yeah. All the nine people uh -huh. that I described, they all died. Yeah. Lazarus got up. Yeah. They all raised up. Yeah. But 30 years later, even Lazarus died. Yeah. 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 But when Jesus rose from the dead, yes. he didn't die again. Yes. Oh, bless his name. Yes. At the end of the story, there is a name or a location for each of those individuals that died. I want to give you a meaning out of the names and locations of those people that died. Zephrahim, the city of the woman whose yeah. son died, means refinement. Shulamite, the city of the woman whose daughter died, means resting place. Yes, Moabite, the name of the thugs that throw the man unto Lazarus tomb. His Moabite means father. After Jesus rose, a multitude of saints raised. Yes, sir. Nan, the city, means beautiful. Yes, Jairus, the name of the leader of the synagogue, means steam. Lazarus' name means God is our helper. Tabitha means graceful move. Eutychus means Fortunate. I say at all of this to bring this message to a close. Uh -huh. Jesus is the first fruit of them that sleep. Yes. That's where we come in. Yes. We are when we are resurrected. We won't die again. Put all nine of those deaths and resurrections together. This is what it says, a refinement to what was a resting place. Our Father has the power that raises up a multitude, has done a beautiful thing by removing the stain of death. And the God who is our helper made a grateful move. And we are fortunate to have a resurrection that is the first fruit of men. Jesus' resurrection was the first fruit of many. When we die, it won't be the end of the story. When I die, I won't get up again. What is this that John McCurtis said? We fall down, but we get up. When I fall down, I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up forever. Life without end. I'm going to live forever. Jesus confirmed that when I get up, I won't die again. One day, I became aware of the fact that Jesus conquered death. Because Jesus lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all my fears are gone. And the song says, and life is worth living because he lives. I'm here to tell you, he'll be your everything. It doesn't matter who you are. He's all together one lovely. 
to the architect. He's a chief builder. To the astronomist, he's the son of righteousness. To the baker, he's the bread of life. To the builder, he's a true foundation. To the biker, he's a hidden treasure. To the jeweler, he's a pearl of great price. To the carpenter, he's a door. To the doctor, he's a great physician. To the educator, he's a master teacher. To the engineer, he's a new and living way. To the geologist, he's a rock of ages. To the horticulture, he's a true and living vine. To the judge, he's the lord of the judge. To the jeweler, he's a faithful and true witness. To the lawyer, he's a wonderful counselor. To the newsman, of great joy to the sinner he's the man of God slain before the foundation of God that takes away the sin Jesus he is my testimony because God is in control, a church where God is really real. Hi, my name is Dennis Rogers, pastor here at the Greater New Bible Word Church of God in Christ. I would like to welcome you to our services. Service times are Sunday morning prayer and Sunday school, 9 a.m. Sunday morning worship, 11 a.m. Sunday evening Pentecostal service, 7 p.m. Midweek service, Thursday, 7